applause from all the short people in the room. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You know, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here with all of you. It's, it's uh, my second time in Olympia, and it's, it's a wonderful spirit here of celebration. Of mourning, yes, but really about celebration and about legacies. This is, <clears throat> this is also an amazing year for anniversaries. This is the 10th anniversary of the killing of Rachel. It's also, on Tuesday, the 10th anniversary of the beginning of the US war in Iraq. And it was a couple of weeks ago, the 10th anniversary <clears throat> of another very important moment, which was the anti-war protests around the world of February 15, 2003. And that was the moment when, in the, what the Guinness Book of World Records called the largest protest in the history of humanity, somewhere between 14 and 15 million people in 665 cities around the world poured into the streets of their capitals, of small towns, 275 cities just here in the United States, but all around the world, beginning in, in the South Pacific and following the sun all the way around, to say no to war, no to a war based on lies. And on February 15th, Rachel was part of an anti-war protest in Rafa with the children of Rafa, who were out there saying no to war. And if you look on the web at the lists of where were the protests of February 15th, and it's by continent and by country, and Palestine is there, there is the protest at Rafa that Rachel was part of. So I think it's very important that we see how these global movements take shape. Because one of the things that's so important here is that while this was a global protest, people all around the world were protesting their own government's possibility, and in some cases reality, of collaboration with Washington, collaboration with the Bush administration in waging these illegal wars in Iraq. It was also a moment when the whole world was focused on a US policy, and it put enormous levels of responsibility on us who live in this country. Those of us who are US citizens, who can vote, and all of us who live here and pay taxes. Because it was our government's policy that that was who was going to profit. This was not a war that was going to keep Americans safe, and Rachel understood that. Children in Gaza understood that. So I think that when we think about Rachel's legacy, it's not only about Rachel, and it's not only about Gaza, it's not only about Rafah. It's about human rights, it's about standing against war, it's about standing for international law and justice and human rights and equality all around the world. It's a global struggle. And I think that that's one of the really important lessons that we, we take away. Now what does that mean for us? You know, Ramsey spoke of the, the obligations that we have, how we have raised the bar of solidarity. And the, for me, the most important part of solidarity, for those of us who live in this country, is to understand our obligations to overturn and transform the policies of our government. To not stand still while they wage wars in our name and support occupations in our name and defend apartheid in our name. But to say, no, not in our name, not any longer, not with our tax money. That becomes our obligation. That becomes our responsibility. So what do we do? The first part of, of changing US policy is to understand what is the policy. What, what's the policy now? What's, what has it been in the past? What's changed? What hasn't? And in one sense, it's kind of easy. You know, US policy in the last generation or more, since the beginning of the Cold War, let's say, hasn't changed that much. It always had three legs, oil, Israel, and stability. You take away one leg and it falls over. They wanted all three of those legs. Now, which one was most important at any given time? That might change, but the fundamentals haven't changed. The goals haven't changed. What's had to change is how Washington fights for those goals. Why? Not because any one administration is any more or less filled with good guys and bad guys. I mean, that's probably true, but on this issue, it hasn't had that much impact. But what's changed is the conditions in which they're trying to win those goals. 
So all of a sudden, the US simply doesn't have the kind of power around the world that it once did. You know, for a while, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. You know, we hear a lot about, well, people in this country don't care about international law. Well, that might be true in the other Washington, that pestilential city that I live in, which is actually a very nice city. I, you know, I, I like that city. It's very green. You can ride your bike everywhere, walk everywhere. But it's pretty pestilential when you talk about what they do in that city. What that means is that there is an understanding that Washington can no longer call the shots around the world as they once did. There was a period, a long period during the Cold War where you had two superpowers challenging each other and they balanced each other out in a certain sick way. The wars that were fought and the wars were brutal and people died in the millions during the Cold War because the war wasn't cold in places like Angola and Mozambique and El Salvador and South Africa and all of the countries around the world where the Cold War became very hot. But at the same time, at the end of the Cold War, suddenly the US emerged as the sole superpower and said, you know what? We're going to show the world that even though our, our old sparring partner is gone, the Soviet Union has collapsed, we're going to show the world that we are still the, you know, the world's power that has to be dealt with. So how do you do that? How do you show the world that you're still the superpower when your sparring partner has disappeared? You can't just announce it at a press conference on CNN. Nobody's going to believe it. You have to show it. So what do you do? You take the world to war. That's what the first Gulf War was all about in 1991. It was showing the world who's boss. And we had a period of a decade or more where the US was pretty much boss. And that's what made possible the war in Iraq. That's what made possible the creation of what became known as the coalition of the willing, which was really the coalition of the coerced, as we, we called it. Some called it the coalition of the billing. But it, was, it had a number of names. But it was driven by US power. So it was challenging that sense of US power. And that's what has now changed in the world. Not militarily, but economically, and politically, and diplomatically, and socially, and in every other way. Culturally, the US just doesn't have the kind of power it once did. So it has to use different kinds of tactics, different kinds of strategies, and wage different kinds of wars. It can no longer, and this is one of the legacies of Rachel's work, and the direct legacy of February 15th, 2003, is that we are not at war in Iran today because the price of waging war has been raised. We have raised the bar on governments having to pay a price for going to war. And that's huge. That's huge. But we're not done yet. We're not done yet. The threat of war in Iran remains. But we're not at war there now. And when we look at how to change these policies, what we have focused on for the last decade or more, especially in the work on Israel-Palestine, but certainly true in, in Iraq as well, look at the situation in Iraq. When we started that war in 2003, there was massive support for the war. There were opposition voices. Many of us were out in protest, as we know, even before the war began. But there was majority support in this country for that war. Today, 73%, I think, was the last poll of people who said, not only I'm against the war in Iraq, wish that it had ended earlier, but it never had any legitimacy and should never have been fought. That's huge. Now, you know all those people didn't really believe that, but let them claim it now. That's a good thing. Let them convince themselves they were always against the war. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. And our movement made that possible. Social movements demanding an end to wars made that possible. When we talk about the changing the policy on Palestine, it's really, really hard. But we have made incredible gains over this last decade. I mean, just look at how the shifts have happened in the academy, in the press, even in Congress, certainly in, in popular culture, in the Jewish community, the rise of an organization like Jewish Voice for Peace, with 150,000 supporters on their, on their email list, more than APAC has. You know, their, their youth group, their rabbinical council. This is huge. This is huge. Now, it doesn't. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean that APAC has no more power. They have the money. This is, a, this is a big problem. But they don't have the popular support. They can no longer claim, as they did for so long when I was growing up in the Jewish community, this was never challenged. We speak for the Jews. Really? 
Actually, not so much. You know, so they may have the money. Why? Because the right wing always has the money. You know, money follows politics, politics follows money. If you have a lot of money, you're likely to move to the right. They've got people with money. So they have money, they are still a threat. Right now, they're pretty desperate because they know they don't have support. There's also a generational shift in the Jewish community where young Jewish kids are growing up without that kind of mindless understanding that Israel stands for me, that many of us once grew up with. It's different now. That's huge. If we look at the symbols of that change, look at the books that have been published. The, the book on the Israel lobby, the Walt Mearsheimer book. Now, I don't happen to agree with a lot of their premise, but it doesn't matter. It broke a huge taboo. President Carter's book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, also a problematic book in a number of ways. But who cares? Five years earlier, you think any publisher would have touched that book, ex-president or not? It was because we have changed the discourse that that becomes possible. And when it happens, it moves that discourse shift even further. Let me give you one other example. 2010, that was the year when we were hearing so much about the US is challenging Israel. Oh my God, the US is throwing Israel under a bus. Oh my God, Obama is challenging Israel. Ay, 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 this is terrible, Obama is challenging Israel. Now in fact, as we know, he wasn't challenging Israel. He wasn't pressuring Israel. But we were being told that he was. Now, okay, pressure looks like stop building settlements. Answer, no. Okay, you're an independent country, you can do what you want, but you know that $30 billion that we pledged to give you in military aid over these 10 years? You can kiss that goodbye. And you know how we protect you at the United Nations so you're never actually held accountable when any of your people are ever charged with war crimes? We're not gonna do that anymore. That's what pressure looks like. We didn't hear that. We didn't hear that. What we, heard, what we heard was a series of requests. Please stop building settlements. Answer, no. Pretty please stop building settlements? No. Please stop building some settlements, at least a little bit, some of the time, for a brief moment? Maybe. No. And then they stopped asking questions. They stopped making requests. But we were being told in the press, Obama is pressuring Israel. So right at that moment, there's a poll taken by the main Democratic Party pollster. And one of the questions is on what do you think about Israeli settlements? And the first question is, Israelis are building settlements across the occupied territories. Which of the following two sentences best describes what you believe? Sentence number one, Israelis are building settlements for security reasons and they have the right to build wherever they want. Sentence number two, Israelis are building on, on occupied land that and the settlement should all be torn down and the land returned to its original owners. They actually, they said expropriated land. Now, that actually is accurate in, in terms of international law, but it's a pretty provocative description, right? You don't have to describe it in quite that provocative a way. But provocation or not, 63% of President Obama's party, 63% of Democrats chose sentence number two. Now, granted, that's a moment in time. It's a snapshot, we know polls are, questionable at best, but at that moment when we were being flooded with this propaganda about how terrible it was that the U.S. is pressuring Israel, that was the popular answer. It wasn't, oh my God, we're pressuring Israel, we better stop. So that's all different. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, which in, is a global phenomenon that is having incredible impact all around the world, in the United States is playing the role of a huge educational campaign that is showing people on all these different levels, beginning with Caterpillar, which was of course the first target of what became known as the BDS movement. There were, there were boycotts against uh, Caterpillar after the killing of Rachel, even before the Palestinian civil society call for the global uh, BDS movement. We are teaching people all around this country what occupation looks like and what US policy, whether it's government policy, corporate policy, institutional policies, what they lead to when they are allowed to reign unchecked. So our job becomes, how do we challenge that? So we see this huge shift in the media. You know, we, we saw it around the Hegel confirmation hearings. When the New York Times runs a, an editorial about how the problem with the Hegel hearings is that it's showing how you can't criticize Israel in the United States, and that's a big problem. 
A few weeks ago, some of you may have heard about the brouhaha at Brooklyn College when there was a, a panel planned about BDS. How many of you heard about this? Everybody heard about Brooklyn College, right? So this was what would have been a normal panel discussion in a university about BDS. Omar Barghouti coming in from Palestine and Judith Butler coming in from Berkeley to talk about BDS. No big deal, right? They, they speak all over the world, these two, right? Wrong. This was Brooklyn. You can't do that in Brooklyn, right? So there's this big scene about it in Brooklyn, and there's lots of opposition. And the New York City Council, 10 members of the New York City Council write this letter actually threatening, as you know, to cut off funding to Brooklyn College if they allow this to go forward. Now, a few years ago, that wouldn't have been so rare. You have threats like that all the time. You know, all these crazy organizations that think they have the right to determine who gets to say what, what, you know. It used to be a pretty violent world out there. You know, 1982, the JDL fired guns into my house to scare me, you know, that kind of stuff. It used to go on all the time. It doesn't happen that way anymore. So what happens now? Okay, they try it again. They get the city council guys on board. They, they, they have this great campaign. We're not gonna allow this to go forward. This is not about the rights of students. This is about protecting our ally. And then the New York Times gets a hold of it. And the New York Times writes a lead editorial, not some op-ed, but their real editorial board position that says, we're very critical of settlements. We don't necessarily agree with BDS. But we certainly think the advocates of BDS, such as Omar Barghouti and Judith Butler, have a right to speak. I mean, when was the last time Judith and Omar got listed in the New York Times editorial page favorably? <laughs> and it goes on to say, what an outrage that there are people in the city council threatening to, uh, to withhold funds. And immediately you have panic in the city council. And they write this letter saying, we never said we would withhold funds. It's like, well, actually, yes, you did. But OK, if you want to withdraw it, that's fine. We'll take it as a withdrawal. You know, I mean, the times have changed. You just can't pull it off anymore. You can't get away with it anymore. And the last example, which is the really weird one, is in Congress, where we think of it as the last bastion. And it is in many ways. And I'll get to that in a minute. But one example where even in Congress, the discourse, the conversation is not what it used to be. If you look back at the congressional effort to discredit the Goldstone Report, right, you remember that. There was this resolution that basically said, let me see, that it called the Goldstone Report unbalanced, one-sided, unacceptable, irredeemably biased, and unworthy of further consideration or legitimacy. A nice balanced resolution. <laughs> but wait, so, and it passed, you know, pretty overwhelmingly. But it did not pass unanimously. It passed, I forget how many in favor, but 36 voted against and 22 voted present. And listen to what a couple people said publicly on the floor of the US Congress in response to that effort. Congressman Keith Ellison, he said that suppressing the report would, quote, undermine President Obama's commitment that all countries, including our own and our allies, should be accountable for their actions. Congressman John Dingell says the report, quote, sends a signal to the world, that the vote, not the report, the vote sends a signal to the world that the United States Congress is not serious about pushing the Israelis and the Palestinians towards a peaceful resolution. Your great co former Congressman Brian Baird, when he stood in front of the picture of, of a Palestinian father grieving over his three children that had been killed in Gaza in Operation Cast Lead, and he says, I have twin four-year-old boys at home. When I kiss them goodnight, they look for all the world like those three little Palestinian children. I don't know that father, but I can imagine his grief. Unlike most of my colleagues here, I have been to Gaza, and I have read in its entirety the Goldstone Report. And I will tell you, he says many things that though unpleasant, are true and must not be obstructed. And finally, Congressman Dennis Kucinich. He says that the resolution should be called the down is up, night is day, wrong is right <laughs> resolution because today we journey from Operation Cast Lead to Operation Cast Doubt. Almost as serious as committing war crimes is covering up war crimes, pretending that war crimes were never committed and did not exist. He warned, quote, if this Congress votes to condemn a report it has not read, concerning events it has totally ignored, about violations of law of which it is unaware, 
it will have brought great shame to this great institution. Now that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. That kind of language would never have been heard on the, on the, on the floor of the US Congress 10 years ago. I would say it would not have been heard five years ago. It's the work of organizations like all of you represented here today, the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation, which now has over 400 member organizations. All of you are members of the US campaign, the Rachel Corey Foundation, all the organizations that have taken up the challenge of transforming how people in this country understand what our obligations are in foreign policy and what our relationship is and needs to be and what changes are needed to get there to have a foreign policy that's based not on support for occupation and apartheid, but one that is based on equal rights for all, equality for all, international law and human rights. So that's the challenge that we face today. That's the challenge that Rachel's legacy poses to us. It's not simply the challenge to go to Gaza and stand with the people of Rafa, or the people of Khan Yunus, the people of Gaza City, the people of Nusrat and Beach Camp. That's part of the challenge. But not everyone can go. And all of us are here. So all of us have obligations to make good on that legacy. The BDS movement is part of that. The movement to stop paying US military aid to Israel is part of that. And one of the things that's so important about this moment in history is that we are standing at a moment when our country itself is really, when people are in great pain here at home because of the policies of our government. And I'm speaking particularly of both the legacy of the costs of these wars and occupations, but also the current economic crisis, the cuts that we're facing in jobs and healthcare and education, in all of the fundamentals of what people need in this country, what poor people need, what the middle class needs. Israel is isolated right now, but APAC, as some of you may know, has the chutzpah to demand that at this moment, when Head Start is being cut, when unemployment insurance is being cut, when there are no jobs, when 20 million children in our country go hungry every night, APAC sent 10,000 lobbyists last Monday to the US Congress to blanket Capitol Hill and demand that military aid to Israel, the 26th wealthiest country in the world, should be exempt from the cuts that will come to every other component of the US federal budget, because Israel is somehow more important than our children. That was the Israeli position. Now it's an outrage, but it also puts us in an incredibly important and great position. I mean, who in this country facing that reality is going to say, oh yeah, I think we should continue to give Israel that $30 billion in military aid, so they can continue their violations of international law and violations of human rights and violations of equality against the Palestinian people. Because that's going to keep us safe and give us jobs and feed our children and provide good housing and health care. Yeah, that's going to be a real popular line. We are in a moment when our connections, our ability to link with other movements, our coalition building has never been stronger. We are no longer a movement that's out on the fringes where nobody in the peace movement wants to talk about Palestine. Oh God, really you guys? Yeah, we really appreciate your solidarity, but could you kind of put your signs away and sort of just say you're a peace group? You know? That's not true anymore. You know, looking around this room, I'm seeing there's some people here who are old enough to remember the bad old days in the peace movement. You know, the largest peace demonstration ever held in the United States was in June of 1982 in Central Park in support of a nuclear weapons freeze. It was the largest peace demonstration ever held. And it was held by coincidence, obviously, but nonetheless, two days after Israel had invaded Lebanon. And every speaker who mounted the stairs to that giant stage in Central Park was warned, you may not speak about Israel. 
and only one violated that restriction. This is a different world. We are at the center of the peace movement. We are part of the peace movement. We were central to United for Peace and Justice, the giant coalition of 1,400 organizations that pulled off the February 15th day the world said no to war in New York City at the foot of the United Nations. And we have been part of the peace movement for more than a decade. So our role now is to move with those other movements and say it's our job to bring that money home, to stop funding the Israeli military. Look at what your tax money just here in Washington State. Washington State is paying for these 10 years of that $30 billion, $731 million of it is coming out of your pockets, your tax money for the state of Washington. You know what you could pay for that? For that same amount of money? You could pay for 8,885 housing vouchers for low-income Section 8 families for 10 years. 8,800 every year for 10 years for that amount of money if it wasn't going to the IDF. You could pay for 12,147 people every year for 10 years to get training for new green jobs. You could pay for 21,600 children to get into a Head Start early reading program. Or you could pay for health care for 592,000 people across the state of Washington for 10 years. What's going to make you safer? That's the message. That's Rachel's legacy, because she was an internationalist. And her legacy is that it's not only about the moral capability to look aside. It's not only about the immorality of war, the immorality of funding occupation. It's also about being strategic. And that means looking at the cost of occupation and reminding people who are hurting, where it's hard right now to ask someone whose children are hungry here in the United States, it's hard to ask them to respond politically to a moral appeal for children somewhere else. But it's not hard to say, you know, there would be money for your children if we were not funding an illegal occupation that's killing children across the world. That's not hard. And that becomes our job. Our movement is strongest when we are challenging U.S. policy grounded in historical reality and grounded in the strategic understanding of how people in this country are paying a price. We are not gaining from this occupation. We are not safer. When people in Gaza, in the brief moment that the bombs stop falling and they look out their window, what do they see? They see a US-made F-16 dropping US-made bombs and a US-made Apache helicopter firing US-made missiles, dropping US-made tear gas. And why are we surprised that people in Gaza and people across Palestine and people throughout the Middle East and around the world hold us responsible? Why are we surprised? It's because we are responsible if we don't challenge our government's policy. That's what makes us not responsible. Our job is to build those links with the other movements that are fighting for jobs, that are fighting for health care, that are fighting for children, that are fighting for the economic rights that we fight for in Palestine and we fight for here at home. There is another anniversary this year. We have another legacy to live up to. This year is the 10th anniversary of Rachel's death, and it is the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. And that's the speech, of course, that we know the best. That's the speech that children learn in grammar school. And we know that in both that speech and in other speeches, particularly his 1967 Why Are We in Vietnam speech, Dr. King taught us that there are three evils at the core of US policy when he said that the United States government is the biggest purveyor of violence in the world. And those are racism and militarism and poverty. And it's our obligation to remember and to teach and to mobilize 
against those evils and to recognize that supporting Israeli occupation of Palestine, supporting Israeli apartheid, supporting Israeli denial of the right of return, these are all examples of those three evils. We are supporting racism and militarism and poverty by supporting US aid to Israel. And that's what we have to stop. Legacies have consequences. The consequence of Rachel's death has been far more than she ever would have anticipated it being. It has mobilized people around the world to take up the question of Palestine and the question of justice. One other unexpected, unexpected consequence. On February 15th, on that day when there were so many millions in the street, half a million in New York City, a million in London, two million in Barcelona, a million in Rome, there was a small protest in Cairo. And some of the demonstrators there said later that they looked around and they were watching the television coverage of all these others, and they said, you know, we were seeing these white whiskey drinking infidels mobilizing in their millions against war in our region. And we were kind of embarrassed that we only had this small group of protesters and thousands of police. But we swore we would do it better next time. Their next time, eight years later, was in Tahrir Square, and they overthrew a dictator. They were some of the same people. That was the kind of unexpected consequence of events that we can't even anticipate. We have already seen what 10 years of mobilization to, if, to, in, to be based on Rachel's legacy has made possible. Imagine what the next 10 years of that legacy is going to bring. Thank you.